Welcome everyone to Young at Heart, session number 126. I'm Father James DeLucio of the Paulist Fathers, back in the parlor, offering stories, songs, nursery rhymes, Mother Goose, Aesop's fables, nonsense, to keep us all young at heart so we can handle our adult difficulties with ingenuity, creativity, and hope. I'm continuing in this series with my reading of Beauty and the Beast, the oldest English version that we have. And this is part seven out of eight. So it's the penultimate episode as we go along our way. Last time we left Beauty in the Beast's castle, who was astounded on how kind he was and how humble and how generous in fact, she is his prisoner, but she was amazed that when she said how much she missed her father, he graciously gave her leave to go and visit him. But he asked only for one week, for if she stayed longer, he was sure he would die of a broken heart. He so loved her and her company. She agreed to do this, and so we concluded yesterday with when she went to bed in the beast's castle, the next morning she awakened to find herself in her father's house. And off we go. When she waked the next morning, she found herself in her father's house and having rung a little bell that was right there at her bedside, she saw the maid come in, who at the moment she saw Beauty gave a loud shriek. And her father came running up the stairs, and he thought he should have died with joy on seeing his daughter once again. He held her fast, locked in his arms, for above a quarter of an hour. As soon as these first transports were over, Beauty began to think of rising, and she was afraid that she had not thought enough to set out a set of clothes for herself. But the maid told her that a trunk had appeared in the next room. She did not know when or how it arrived, but it was filled with gowns and jewels and diamonds and many of the gowns were made out of gold thread. Well, Beauty went to the trunk and she chose the plainest of all the dresses determined to give the rest to her dear sisters. But as soon as she thought this, the trunk disappeared and her father told her it must be the beast insisting, Beauty, that you keep these treasures for yourself. And when she said that that is then indeed what she would do, the trunk miraculously reappeared. Beauty dressed herself, and in the meantime she sent for her sisters, who hasted thither with their husbands. They were both of them very unhappy in their marriages. The eldest had married a gentleman extremely handsome indeed, but he was so fond of his own person that he cared for nothing other than his dear self, and he neglected his wife. The second had married a man of wit, but he only made use of it to plague and torment everybody, especially his wife. Beauty sisters saw her and sickened with envy. They saw her dressed like a princess and more beautiful than ever, nor could all her obliging, affectionate behavior towards them 
stifle their jealousy, which was ready to burst out when she confessed how happy she was and how well treated by the beast. The two sisters went down into the garden to vent their tears of rage and said to one another, In what is this little creature better than us, that she should be so much happier? What is it with these ladies? <laughs> Sister, said the oldest, a thought just strikes me. Let us endeavor to detain her beyond the week she promised to the beast. And perhaps the silly monster will be so enraged at her for breaking her word that he will come and devour her on the spot. Right, sister, answered the other. Therefore, to detain her, let us show her as much kindness as possible. After they had taken this resolution, they went up and they behaved so affectionately towards beauty that the poor sister wept for joy, thinking that they had experienced some kind of transformation. When the week had expired, the sisters cried. They tore at their hair. They seemed so sorry to part with beauty that beauty promised to stay a week longer. In the meantime, beauty could not help reflecting on herself for the uneasiness that she was likely to cause the poor beast whom she sincerely loved and really longed to see again. The tenth night she spent at her father's, she dreamt she was in the palace garden, and in the dream she saw a beast extended on the grass plat who seemed just expiring, and in a dying voice he called out to her, reproaching her for her ingratitude. Beauty started out of her sleep, bursting into tears. Am I not very wicked, said she, to act so unkindly to beast who has studied me so much to please me in everything? Is it his fault if is he is it his fault if he is so ugly? And is it his fault if he makes so little sense? He is kind and he is good, and that is sufficient for me. Why did I refuse to marry him? I should be happier with the monster than with my fickle sisters, and certainly more with him than my sisters are with their husbands, for it is neither wit nor a fine person in a husband that makes a woman happy, but virtue sweetness, sweetness of temper, and complacence, and beast has all these valuable qualifications. It is true. I do not feel the tenderness of affection for him, but I find I have the highest gratitude, esteem, and friendship. Beauty, having said this, Rose put her ring on the table next to her bed and lay down again, and scarce was she in the bed and fell asleep. She found herself awake the next morning, overjoyed to be back in the castle of the beast. And what do you think of that? Well, we will bring this all to a close tomorrow with the final section of Beauty and the Beast with commentary, if you wish. Plus, I will offer very brief summaries of some of all the other alternate versions of this story. It's amazing how many I am finding 
indeed, different dreams of all different kinds, some with sisters and brothers, some without. Fascinating. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you have a lovely evening. If you go out, please wear your mask, stay safe, keep healthy, and take those blessings from above. I ask that for all of us so that we can stay grounded even if we encounter beasts. God bless. Bye, everyone.